Recording by Dale Grothman. The punishment had to fit more than just the crime. It had to suit every world in the galaxy. The Eel by Miriam Allen de Ford. He was intimately and unfavorably known everywhere in the galaxy, but with special virulence on eight planets in three different solar systems. He was eagerly sought on each. They all wanted to try him and punish him, in each case by their own laws and customs. This had been going on for twenty-six terrestrial years, which means from minus ten to plus two hundred and eighty in some of the others. The only place that didn't want him was Earth, his native planet, where he was too smart to operate. But, of course, the galactic police were looking for him there, too, to deliver him to the authorities of the other planets in accordance with the interplanetary constitution. For all those years the eel, which was his Earth moniker, elsewhere he was known by names indicating equally squirmy and slimy life-forms, had been gaily going his way, known under a dozen different aliases turning up suddenly here, there, and everywhere, committing his gigantic deceptions, and disappearing as quickly and silently when his latest enterprise had succeeded. He specialized in enormous, unprecedented thefts. It was said that he despised stealing anything under the value of a hundred million terrestrial units, and most of his thefts were much larger than that. He had no recognizable modus operandi, changing his methods with each new crime. He never left a clue. But, in bravado, he signed his name to every job. His moniker flattered him, and after each malfaction the victim, usually a government agency, a giant corporation, or one of the clan enterprises of the smaller planets, would receive a message consisting merely of an impudent depiction of a large, wiggly eel. They got him at last, of course. The galactic police, like the prehistoric Royal Canadian Mounted, have the reputation for always catching their man. Sometimes they don't catch him till he's dead, but they caught him. It took them twenty-six years, and it was a hard job, for the eel always worked alone, and never talked afterwards. They did it by the Herculean effort of investigating the source of the fortune of every inhabitant of Earth, since all that was known was that the eel was terrestrial. Every computer in the Federation worked overtime, analyzing the data fed into it. It wasn't entirely a thankless task, for... As a by-product, a lot of embezzlers, tax evaders, and lesser robbers were turned up. In the end, it narrowed down to one man who owned more than he could account for having. Even so, they almost lost him, for his takings were cashed away under so many pseudonyms that it took several months to establish that they all belonged to the same person. When it was settled, the police swooped. The eel surrendered quietly, the one thing he had been surest of, was never being apprehended, and he was so dumbfounded he was unable to put up any resistance. And then came a still greater question. Which of the planets was to have him? Zixtel said it had first right because his theft there had been the largest, a sum so huge it could be expressed only by an algebraic index. Arthur's argument was that his first recorded crime had been on that planet. Medoras wanted him because its only penalty for any felony was an immediate and rather horrible death, and that would guarantee getting rid of the eel forever. Ceres had a claim on the grounds that it was the only planet or moon in the solar system in which he had operated, and since he was a terrestrial, it was a matter for local jurisdiction. Ebb pleaded that it was the newest and poorest member of the Galactic Federation, and should have been protected in its inexperience against his thievishness. Ha Almerinth argued that it had earned his custody because it was its chief ruler who had suggested to police the method which had resulted in his arrest. Valvanor countered that it should be chosen recipient, since the theft there had included desecration of the High Temple. Little Agsk, which was only a probationary galactic associate, modestly said that if it were given the eel, its prompt and exemplary punishment might qualify it for full membership and it would be grateful for the chance. A special meeting of the Galactic Council had to be called for the sole purpose of deciding who got the eel. Representatives from all the claimant planets made their representations. Each told in eloquent detail why his planet, and his alone, was entitled to custody of the arch-criminal, and what they would do to him when, not if, 
they got him. After they had all been heard, the councillors went into executive session with press and public bard. An indiscreet councillor, it was O. Al of Fillingor of Altair, if you want to know, leaked later some of the rather indecorous proceedings. The Earth councillor, he reported, had been granted a voice, but no vote, since Earth was not an interested party as to the crime but only as to the criminal. Each possible system of arbitration had been discussed, chronologically, numerically in respect to the size of the theft, legalistically, in respect to whether the culprit should be available to hand on to another victim when the first had got through punishing him. In the welter of claims and counterclaims, one harassed counselor wearily suggested a lottery. Another, in desperation, recommended handing the eel a list of prospective punishments on each of the eight planets, and observing which one seemed to inspire him with the most dread, which would then be the one selected. One even proposed poisoning him, and announcing his sudden collapse and death. The sessions went on day and night. The exhausted counselors separated for brief periods of sleep, then went at it again. A hung jury was unthinkable. Something had to be decided. The news outlets of the entire galaxy were beginning to issue sarcastic editorials about procrastination and coddling criminals, with hints about bribery and corruption, and remarks that perhaps what was needed was a few impeachments and a new general election. So at last, in utter despair, they awarded the eel to Agsk as a sort of bonus and incentive. Whatever planet they named, the other seven were going to scream to high heaven and Agsk was least likely to be able to retaliate against any expression of indignation. Agskins, as everyone knows, are fairly humanoid beings, primitives from the outer edge of the galaxy. They were like college freshmen, invited to the senior fraternity. It was their big chance to make good. The eel, taciturn as ever, was delivered to a delegation of six of them sent to meet him in one of their lumbering spaceships a low counter-grab machine such as earth had outgrown several millennia before they were so afraid of losing him that they put a metal belt around him with six chains attached to it and fastened all six of themselves to him once on agsk he was placed in a specifically made stone pit surrounded by guards and fed through the only opening in preparation for the influx of visitors to the trial an anticipated greater assembly of off-planeters than little Agsk had ever seen. They evacuated their capital city temporarily, resettling all its citizens except those needed to serve and care for guests, and remodeled the biggest houses for the accommodation of those who had peculiar space, shape, or other requirements. Never, since the Galactic Federation was founded, had so many beings, human, humanoid, semi-humanoid, and non-humanoid, gathered at the same time on any one member planet every news tape tritemens audio and all other varieties of information services even including the drum amplifiers of medoris and the ray variants of ebb applied for and were granted a place in the courtroom this because no other edifice was large enough was an immense stone amphitheater usually devoted to rather curious games with animals since it rains on Agsk only for two specified hours on each one of their days, no roof was needed. At every seat was a translophone, with interpreters ready in plastic cages, to translate the intergalactic in which the trial was conducted into even the clicks and hisses of Jorg and the eye flashes of a Monroe. In the midst of all of this, the cause and purpose of it all sat the legendary eel, seen at last he was hardly an impressive figure. Time had been going on, and the eel was in his fifties, bald and a trifle paunchy. He was completely ordinary in appearance, a circumstance which had, of course, enabled him to pass unobserved on so many planets. He looked like a salesman or a minor official, and indeed had been so taken by the unnoticing inhabitants of innumerable planets. People had wondered when the word came of some new outrage by this master thief, if perhaps he had disguised himself as a resident of the scene of each fresh crime, but now it was obvious that this has not been necessary. He had been too clever to pick any planet where visitors from Earth were not a common sight. 
and he had been too insignificant for anyone to pay attention to him. The criminal code of X was unique in the galaxy, though there were rumors of something similar among the legendary extinct tribes on Earth called the Gauches. The high priest is also the chief executive, as well as the minister of education and the head of the medical facility, and he rules jointly with a priestess who also officiates as chief judge. The Agskins have some strange ideas to the terrestrial eye. For example, suicide is an honor, and any one of insufficient rank who commits it condemns his immediate family to punishment for his presumption. They are great family people, in general. Also, they never lie, and find it hard to realize that other beings do. Murder, to them, is merely a matter for negotiation between the murderer and the relatives of the victim, provided it is open and without deceit. But grand larceny, since property is the foundation of the family, is punished in a way that shows that the Axkians, though technologically primitive, are psychologically very advanced. They reason that death, because it comes inevitably to all, is the least of misfortunes. Lasting grief, remorse, and guilt are the greatest. So they let the thief live, and do not even imprison him. Instead, they find out who it is that the criminal most loves. If they do not know who it is, they merely ask him, and since Axkians never lie, he always tells them. Then they seize that person and kill him or her, slowly and painfully, before the thief's eyes. And the agreement had been that the eel was to be tried and punished by the laws and customs of the planet to which he was awarded. The actual trial and conviction of the eel were almost perfunctory, without needing to resort to torture his jailers had been presented, on a platter as it were, with a full confession, so far as the particular robbery he had committed on Agsk was concerned. There was a provision for defense in the Agskian Code, but it was unneeded because the eel had pleaded guilty. But he knew very well he would not be executed by the Agskians. He would instead be set free, presumably with a broken heart, to be handed over to the next claimant and that, the council had decided, would be Medoros. Since Medoros always kills its criminals, that would be the end of the whole controversy. So the eel was quite aware that his conviction by Agsk would be only the preliminary to an exquisitely painful and lingering demise at the two clawed hands of Medorians. His business was somehow to get out from under. Naturally, the resources of the Galactic Police had been at the full disposal of the officials of Agsk. The files had been opened, and the Agskians had before them the eel's history, back to the day of his birth. He himself had been questioned, encephalographed, hypnotized, dormitized, injected, psychographed, subjected to all means of eliciting information devised by all eight planets. For the other seven, once their full resentment was over, had reconciled themselves and cooperated wholeheartedly with the Askians, Medoras especially had been the greatest help. The Medorians could hardly wait. In the spate of news of the trial that had inundated every portion of the galaxy, there began to be discovered a note of sympathy for this one little creature arrayed against the mightiest powers of the galaxy, poor people who wished they had his nerve, and romantic people who dreamed of adventures they would never dare perform, begin to say that the eel wasn't so bad after all. He became a symbol of the rebellious individual, thumbing his nose at entrenched authority. Students of Earth prehistory will recognize such symbols in the mythical Robin Hood and Al Capone. These were the people who were glad to put up when bets began to be made. At first the odds were ten to one against the eel. Then, as time dragged by, they dropped until it was even money. Agsk itself began to worry. It was one thing to make a big, expensive splurge to impress the galaxy, and to hasten its acceptance into full membership in the Federation. But nobody had expected the show to last more than a few days. If it kept on much longer, Agsk would be bankrupt, for the trial foundered on one insoluble problem. The only way the eel could ever be punished by their laws was to kill the person he most loved and nobody could discover that he had ever loved anyone. His mother, his father, he had been an undutiful and unaffectionate son, 
and his parents were long since dead in any case. He had never had a brother, a sister, a wife, or a child. No probing could find any woman with whom he had ever been in love. He had never had an intimate friend. He did nothing to help, naturally. He simply sat in his chains and smiled and waited. He was perfectly willing to be escorted from the court every evening, relieved of his fetters, and placed in his pit. It was a much pleasanter existence than being executed inch by inch by the Midorians. For all he cared, the Ascarians could go on spending their planetary income until he finally died of old age. The priestess judge and her co-adjudicators wore themselves down in discussion far into the night. They lost up to fifteen pounds apiece, which on ags, where the average weight of adults is about forty, was serious. It began to look as if the eel's judges would predecease him. Whom did the eel love? They went into minutia and subterfuge. He had never had a pet to which he was devoted. He had never even loved a house which could be raised. He could not be said to have loved the immense fortune he had stolen, for he had concealed his wealth and used little of it, and, in any event, it had been confiscated and, so far as possible, restored proportionately to those he had robbed. What he had loved most, doubtless, was his prowess in stealing unimaginable sums and getting away with it. But there was no way of killing a criminal technique. Almost a year had passed. Agsk had begun to wish the eel had never been caught, or that they had never been awarded the glory of trying him. At last the priestess judge, in utter despair, took off her judge's robes, put on the cassock and surplus of her sacred calling, and laid the problem before the most unapproachable and august of the gods of Ask. The trial was suspended while she lay for three days in trance on the high altar. She emerged weak and tottering, her skin a light blue instead of its healthy purple, but her head high and her mouth curved in triumph. At sight of her, renewed excitement surged through the audience. News gatherers, who had been finding it difficult of late to get anything to report, rushed to their instruments. Remove the defendant's chains and set him free, the priestess judge ordered in a ringing tones. The great god of the unspeakable name has revealed to me whom the defendant most loves. As soon as he is freed, seize him and slay him, for the only being he loves is himself. There was an instant silence, and then a roar the Midorians howling in frustration. But the eel, still guarded but unchained, stood up and laughed aloud. Your great god is a fool, he said blasphemously. I deny that I love myself. I care nothing for myself at all. The priestess judge sighed. Since this is your sworn denial, it must be true, she said. So then we cannot kill you. Instead, we grant that you do indeed love no one. Therefore, you are a creature so far outside our comprehension that you cannot come under our laws, no matter how you have broken them. We will notify the Federation that we abandon our jurisdiction and hand you over to our sister planet, which is next in line to judge you. Then all the viewers on Tridiments on countless planets saw something that nobody had thought to see. The eel's armor of self-confidence cracked, and terror poured through the gap. He dropped to his knees and cried, Wait, wait, I confess that I blasphemed your God, but without realizing that I did. You mean, pressed the high priestess judge, you acknowledge that you yourself are the only being dear to you? No, not that either. Until now I have never known love. But now it has come upon me like a nova, and I must speak the truth. He paused, still on his knees, and looked piteously at the priestess judge. Are, are you bound by your law to, to believe me and to kill instead of me, this, this thing I adore? We are so bound, she stated. Then, said the eel, smiling and confident again, rising to his feet, before all the galaxy, I must declare the object of my sudden but everlasting passion. Great lady, it is you. The eel is still in his pit, which has been made more comfortable by his sympathizers, while the Council of the Galactic Federation seeks feverishly and vainly 
year after year, to find some legal way out of this impasse. AGSC, however, requests all Federation citizens to submit solutions, the grand prize for the workable answer being a lifetime term as President of the Planet, a secondary contest, prize, lifetime ambassadorship to the Galactic Federation, is offered for a legal way around the statute barring criminals, specifically the eel, from entering the primary contest. End of The Eel by Miriam Allen DeFord